we will discuss the five lawsuits that we believe you could file against the child support agency. We researched the Department of Justice letter that was issued on March 14th, 2016, and the information that was gleaned from that document help us to prepare this presentation. For example, we for in violation on the Department of Motor Vehicles, support magistrate and quasi-judges, judges, police officers, sheriffs, including social workers, and your employer. Yes, and your employer. Let's get started. My name is Chris, and on this channel, we provide information on the statutes and codes of the child support agency, and we show how it's in conflict with your civil rights. We provide education, both private and public, on decisions, case laws, precedents, statutes, and codes. We also review affidavits, summons, complaints, and motions. And we also ask that you subscribe to our channel. In 2016, the Department of Justice issued a nine page letter that talks about how various government agencies comes into conflict with civil rights. In addition, inside the document, they specified on page three that this information should be issued to judges to assist them in performing their dues, duties lawfully and effectively. If you'd like to include this letter as well as other documents into your current court case, we will walk you through the steps of what is called judicial notice of facts. At the end of this presentation, we have a section called call to action where we'll show you step-by-step step how to, if you'd like, introduce this document into your court case. Okay, as we progress through this, we'll be talking about many different cases and we will cite laws and court decisions. So let's start off with the non-lawyer maxim. First of all, any group or individual who like to assist anyone in a legal action they cannot be charged with what's called unauthorized practice of law. That's the NAACP versus Buttons. Also, no states can convert a liberty into a license and therefore charge a fee. That's the case with Murdoch versus Pennsylvania. And that is the information that we provide here on this channel are from our research, from our review, and therefore represented to you under freedom of information. In addition, the practice of law cannot be licensed by any state and neither can the practice of law can be deemed what is called punishable under sanctions. That includes Shearer versus Board of Exam, as well as Shearer versus Cullen. So the information we provide here is for education purposes. And, but if someone wants to use that education to assist or help themselves, there is no liability attached. So let's get started. In order to file an action or a lawsuit against the child support agency and its staff, you could use what is called Title 18 USC Section 242. And what it states is anyone on operating under the color of law or statutes or courts can be sued in a court of law. We have a video on this channel called Defending My Rights. We provide additional detail and more detailed on the Title 18 program. Jurisdiction and venue. This question comes up a lot. In order for you to file an action, you need to determine its jurisdiction and its venue. Well, through our research, we found that whether you start in state court, you could move that case to federal court. And if you start off in federal court, you could move a Title 42 case into state court. In other words, it has concurrent jurisdiction. So it's a matter of convenience as to where you start your case. So let's review the case called Haywood versus Drown. Now, this is a particular case in New York.
The legislators in New York decided to set up a separate tribunal for what they call corrections officers that were being sued under Title 42. Well, Justice Stevens delivered the opinion of a court that says the legislators in any state cannot set up a separate tribunal in order to handle what is called federal claims because the supremacy clause of the United States that says that states must entertain and decide or make decisions on a Title 42 case. So the reality check is a state cannot refuse your Title 42 action. Bell versus Hood. When you bring an action against a state, the state normally pleads what is called 11th Amendment immunity that deters or prevents someone from filing a lawsuit against the state. It's being used incorrectly. Now, under Bell versus Hood, here's the criteria. The rule is if there is a constitutional violation, whether or not the courts has jurisdiction or the federal court decides to take the jurisdiction, they must first determine whether or not the violation occur because that is an action at law prior to determining whether or not they have jurisdiction. That's the reason why whether you're starting federal or state, you must first discover whether or not there is issue of controversy regarding violation of your rights. It then says, once that has been determined, then the issue of jurisdiction is no longer a problem because the goal of every court is to do what? Is to provide the remedy to right a wrong, whether the petition is in a family court or the goal is to right a wrong before determining jurisdiction. We will do a video on the 11th Amendment immunity and show how the proper way in which for you to understand it as well as provide a defense for that. The Supreme Court states in Abelman versus Booth that any case that is settled in one state can be used in another state and therefore that new state cannot then relitigate something that's already mattered, that's already considered settled. Howlett versus Rose. We have a video called Know Your Rights. We talk about how to properly understand what happens when you are referencing a, a case in one state and you'd like to include that in your paperwork. As always, the Supreme Court says that we welcome uh, pro per or pro se litigants to an action within court as long as they follow the rules of the court. So if you were to start an action by yourself with or without an attorney, that's a choice you make. Understand that you still have to follow those rules. All right, so let's begin. Let's start off with the lawsuits. Now, in the DOJ letter, there were nine pages and they spell out all the violations that have occurred or have been complained to them from people regarding the agencies. So let's start off with the part of motor, motor vehicles. Under 22 CFR 5170, child support has a policy in which that they automatically suspend your driver's license and their restrictions. Well, you can bring an action against the Department of Motor Vehicle for what is called a violation of your rights, due process. The reason is revoking your driver's license only has to do with payment. It has nothing to do with how you handle yourself on the roadway. Therefore, why are you removing your driver's license? Let's review a case that was recently decided called Cavadas versus Department of Motor Vehicles. Now, in this case, the Cavadas case, it was decided in New Jersey. The docket number is MERL-1004-15. And in this case, it was decided in January of 2019. The Judge Jacobson says that the automatic suspension of driver's license as a result of non-payment violates the due process and fundamental fairness. And therefore, all licenses need to be returned. Now, this is a 
interesting ruling. Now, there have been many cases filed against apartment motor vehicles, and they've always concluded that they had immunity. There was no immunity for Department of Motor Vehicles. Now, in this decision, which spans 187 pages, the judge highlighted that not only were they revoking the license, but they were also targeting the low and income who, from time to time, has problems paying their child support. And so this was this information was released to the public uh, this year. So this is a template for a lawsuit. So if you feel that you lost your license or any license as a result of non-payment, the template for this is you could download or contact the agency for all their briefs, their documents, and just update it, read the laws that are specified in there, and basically file your case. Next, support magistrate and quasi-judges. Under New York law, which is applicable to all states, because all state has the same description, 205.32, a support magistrate shall be appointed by the chief administrator of the courts for three years to what they call support proceedings in family court. One of the requirements as the, the support officer is a non-judicial officer of the court. But here's what they don't specify. They're also not a certified public accountant. Almost always, they're not a licensed tax preparer. And of course, they're not a licensed bookkeeper. And further, they're not a licensed fi a financial advisor. Therefore, how can a non-judicial officer conduct accounting and, and be expected to call that a judicial process? That would mean every accountant in the country would be performing a judicial process, which is ludicrous at best and ridiculous at work. So in our opinion, every support officer can be sued and they do not have immunity because in order to have immunity, you must be what? Performing your function. Your function is not calculating tax returns. You're not. So in Ex Parte Young, it states that 11th Amendment immunity does not apply to support magistrate, even if they argue that they're doing quasi-judicial. I have yet to see any support manager tell any accountant that what they perform across this country is a judicial function. It is a financial function. So therefore, 11th Amendment immunity, in our opinion, does not apply. And the case law is Owen versus State of Independence, ex parte Young. So you can bring an action against a support magistrate. And as we said, every support magistrate has to prove on the record that calculating the child support using a tax return and accounting is a judicial function performed by every attorney across the country and every judge across the country. That would one of their proof. And of course, they cannot prove that. Now, why is this an issue? Many of the problems with child support is that they miscalculate the total funds. We feel they do that deliberately to ensure that they have the maximum child support collected because they are charged with doing what is called imputed income, not actual income, imputed income. And we will do a, 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 we will do a video on that because it's, it's interesting to understand how they do the calculations. So let's move on. Child Support Enforcement, which is Title 42666, has the ability to contract with the police officer, sheriff, wardens, private prisons. In other words, they has the opportunity to basically put you behind bars. Well, you can bring a Title 42 action against those police officers in the court system. On the, the rule of Peyton versus New York, which is a Second Circuit case, says those warrants or warrants that are issued for your arrest if they don't contain all the elements for a legal warrant under the Constitution, then they have violated due process of law. Therefore, you can sue them, again, 
under Title 42. And of course, Monell versus New York Department of Social Services, you could also sue the child support as conspirator or possible conspirator in carrying out this warrant. Contractors, number four, social and health workers. They're also contracted under 45 CFR 75.2. They're also what is called private actors who again work with the government to perform a government function. The court has held that you can bring an action against them for violation of due process. And the case is called Dennis versus Sparks or Pennsylvania versus Board of Directors. You can bring a lawsuit against the social worker, the attorney for the children, just about anyone who has a contract with the Title IV-D Child Support Agency. Next, and finally, your employer. Your employer performs what is called income withholding under 45 CFR 303.100. And forgive me if I did not quote the specific numbers, but in essence, they do income withholding. Do you also know that they get paid a fee for taking that money from your paycheck? Have they disclosed that fee as well? Did they give you an opportunity to rebut or file a rebuttal against uh, taking those fees? Luger versus Edmondson is the case. You can, again, bring a private action under Title 42 for both conspiracy to commit a violation. So yes, now many of you are concerned about you don't, don't want to take your employer to court. Well, if, you can, if your employer, quote unquote, is conspiring, quote unquote, with the child support agency, then that's a violation and you have rights. So this brings us to the section, what we call call to action. That is an area in which that we make some suggestions as what you can do for your case. If you'd like to submit the Department of Justice letter and the denial of rights letter into your case or introduce that into your case, the procedures is called judicial notice. And that is a judicial notice may be taken at any stage of a hearing, trial, or other proceedings. That is, if you'd like to include this within the next few days into your case, you can interject and include this into your case using the rule of judicial notice. So let's, let us give you some examples of what a judicial notice looks like, and let's get started. So here's a sample of a judicial notice. Now, this particular judicial notice was presented to the Second Circuit Court in New York. And there's the cover page with the appellant and the defendant. So in your case, depending on the state you're in, depending on the tribunal you're in, whether it's family court or Supreme Court or district court, you will have a cover page. Now, following that cover page, you will have what is called request for, for judicial notice. That's your heading. And under that, you specify that you'd like to submit these documents under Federal Rules of Evidence 201. Now, earlier we said the federal rules and the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, so it's perfectly okay to use that in any local court. So what, you, so what you're doing is you're asking the court to take the request of judicial notice. And here's the, uh, the text that goes with that. So in that letter, you're also adding what is called Exhibit A and Exhibit B or any other exhibits you would like to include. So ex Exhibit A could be, for example, the Department of Justice letter. Exhibit B would be your denial of rights letter, what you've already served to the parties. Next, you will have a heading, what is called, you want to support 
the request for judicial notice. So first you ask to include it. Now you're going to support it with case laws. Uh, the case law that's normally used or sometimes used is Singh versus Ash Ashcroft from the Ninth Circuit. There are others that can be used as well. But what you're explaining to the court that you have the authority in which to do that, and you're explaining the, the reasons and the case laws that will allow you to enter these documents into your case. Next, you close that with a conclusion that you're asking the court to include your document and you must sign it and you should have a notary stamped or sit before a notary and have this notarized before entering into the court system. You also must include a certificate of service, which means you've served all the parties in the case. Then you follow up with what is called the Exhibit A. And that would be, again, the Department of Justice letter. And Exhibit B would be the Denial of Rights letter. Again, a, a sample of it with all the individuals that you have served this, which would be a true copy. And then any other exhibits you have, you have Exhibit C, D, you can include. So that brings us to the end of this presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us. Uh, also, we're asking for donation or to help us continue, continue to do our research and to provide what is called the appropriate relevance for your case. And thank you for listening to our channel. Please subscribe. Here are links in which of other courses that you should review or can review for us. And thank you very much.